But sometimes I think some of the most beautiful moments in scripture are, are not as complicated as we make them. She calls out, Rabbi, teacher. Oh, my old teacher, he's back. And, he's, and he's, she's embracing him. He says, stop clinging to me. Stop clinging to what you used to know about me. Stop clinging to the only version of my life with your life that you know, because standing in front of you, there is something far greater than what you used to know. Some of us here are standing right in front of the risen Savior, and he's saying to you, stop clinging to the version of your story that you used to know. And I know that you wrote a script for your story. You wrote a script for what your life would look like, and then the thing happened, and it all fell apart. It's as if somebody took the script and just kind of threw it at your feet. I know, I know, but the risen Christ comes to all of us and says, I've got a better script for you. Stop clinging to what you no longer have control over and live. Sometimes he comes to us disguised as our lives, and yet that's not the only story in John chapter 20. That night they gather again, somewhat in fear. We're told in John chapter 20 that there, the disciples gather in this borrowed room behind locked doors. And the text literally says, out of fear for the religious leaders, because all they knew was this woman had this story about seeing Jesus, but nobody can really prove it yet. So, so it's probably hearsay. It's just an idle tale, scripture says. And so they lock themselves up behind closed doors because that's what you do when you are afraid of an outcome you can't control. That's what you do. You are crippled with fear and the fear of being isolated. They might do to us what they did to him. And if you know what it's like to be crippled by a fear that you can't control the outcome of your life, well, then you're in good company. You're in that locked up room borrowed that night. And then to their greatest surprise, Jesus, the resurrected one, shows up in front of them and he's there with them in the midst of that frightened room and he says, peace, be with you. Look, here are my hands and here's my side. Look, I am alive. He breathes on them, empowers them and then he does something interesting. I've never really noticed it this way until this week. He makes them look at each other. He says, if you retain the sins of others, they'll be retained. But if you forgive the sins of others, they'll be be forgiven. You'll be free. Look at each other. You're not as alone as you think you are. See, sometimes God shows up disguised as your life. It may be possible that God is calling you to gather with one or two others. Because every time I gather with one or two others, I'm reminded, oh, you're doing the thing too. Oh, and you've been through this thing too. Oh, and you're carrying the same load that I thought I was carrying all by myself. Well, how about that? He's among us and in us and with us, and I never knew it. Sometimes he comes disguised as your life. The beauty of that room is that they look around and say, oh, he is alive. But there's one who wasn't in the room. His name was Thomas. And in the church, unfortunately, we've called Thomas doubting Thomas unfairly because he wasn't there that night and all week long the disciples kept telling him in fact in the Greek it's an ongoing action it says they kept on and on and on telling him he's alive trust me he's alive take our word for it and he says I refuse to take your word for it because I've been through some things and I was burned when I used to take somebody's word for it without proving it myself. Somebody here understands what it's like to need proof. I don't like calling him Doubting Thomas. I like calling him what others have called him, uh, Honest Thomas, or Take It or Leave It Thomas, or uh, You See What You Get, You Get What You See Thomas. Because there he is. He's like, I don't I've been hurt before. Somebody here knows what it's like to have been so burned that you've got the scar tissue from the previous wound that makes you unable, literally unable to take somebody's word for it. You have to see for yourself. In fact, in the Greek, there is a moment there where they say, hey, just they keep on telling him he's alive, he's alive. And he says, I will not believe unless I see the scar prints in his hands and put my hand in the nail print or the scar in his side. I won't believe. But in Greek, the word is pistis, which means faith. He literally is saying, I can't have faith 
in someone unless I see their scars. And somebody is here on an Easter Sunday morning and you've got a few scars from wounds that have caused you to need some proof. And I'm here to say you've been shamed before by having doubts. You've been made to feel less spiritual because you have some doubts about this thing. And I'm here to tell you that Thomas is here to tell us that doubt is not the opposite of faith. That the doubt is not a lack of faith. Doubt is an act of faith because to get there, it's not a binary choice. It's not either you are a believer or a doubter. But if we're all honest, if you've never had a doubt, come on, you've never had a thought. We move and breathe and live and have our existence with a mixture of belief and doubt. And so do you know what Jesus did? He shows up the next week and with Thomas, he didn't shame him for needing proof. He didn't belittle him for not being spiritual enough to take the other brother's word for it. He says, you need what you need. You need here. Put your hand here. Put your fingers right here. I want you to feel that I am alive. Somebody here needs to understand that Christ wants you to live so desperately, so deeply, so passionately. He wants you to live and experience the resurrection that he's... He's trying to show you, put your hand in my wound and you will feel that I understand your wound. Well, here's what's interesting about chapter 20. At chapter 20, it kind of ends with that kind of story and it ends with a very curious couple of verses. If you're in John chapter 20, here's how the chapter ends. And I love this. I just recently uh, was shown this and I just... Chapter 20 ends with these words. Now, here are these resurrection encounters. There's Mary. The guys go away. They begin to believe. They gather in fear. Jesus shows up. Thomas comes the next week. All these wonderful things happen in chapter 20. And then it appears as if chapter 20 comes to a close. Chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The end, roll credits. In fact, most scholars believe that is the original ending of chapter 12 or 20 and the ending of the gospel of John. It ends right there. It's a fine sign off. It's a, it's a, it's a, we're done here. It's as if he's saying, man, there's a lot I could tell you. There's just no time. There's, there's no time to get into all that he has done. But I've told you these few things so that you know it's for you too. But then he does something interesting. He's like a Baptist preacher. He doesn't stop talking. Chapter 21, he's like, everything's over. There's a lot that I haven't told you. Um, Okay, but there's one more thing. And in chapter 21, he tells this story, just in case there is someone who thinks that you don't fit in the story of resurrection. It's almost as if John is saying, yeah, 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 he's not finished. He's not finished with you. And then he tells the story of the men who go fishing. And they're down and they're depressed and they're disillusioned. They're about to give it all up and and they go fishing and they go in this boat out on the sea and on this boat at sea is Peter. Do you remember Peter? And how Peter was the one who said, I will go with you to the very end. Even if it requires my life, Lord, I will never turn my back on you. And that's when Jesus said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He said, no, no, you're right about most things. You're wrong about that, Lord. It's not going to happen. And then he did. He, he, he failed. I mean, blew it. It was a failure of nerve. There was a failure of faith, a failure of courage. And, and there he was, an absolute mess of a man. And here he is, just floating on the sea. Floating on a sea of his own shame. Have, have you ever been buoyed by your own remorse, regret, and shame? And then all of a sudden, in the midst of his self-loathing, there's a voice from the shore. Have you caught any fish? They answer back, no. Try casting your nets on the other side. 
They cast the nets. They bring in a haul of fish and they recognize someone says, it's the Lord. And then we're told in the scriptures that Peter, it's a really kind of a, they were told when they recognize it's the Lord, it says, then Peter got dressed for he was naked, which is weird. <laughs> You're right, right? It's so weird. Uh, the Bible's got really cool, weird stuff in it. And, <laughs> and it says, after he got dressed, he jumps in the sea. And you and I think, oh, he's going to jump in like Forrest Gump and just beat the others to the shore. Oh, Lord, you're here. I'm so glad. Hey, about that thing the other day, can we just kind of, are we good? Are we, and he just, we think he's swimming toward the Lord, but the Bible never tells us which side of the boat he jumps out of. He sees the Lord, gets dressed because he was naked. He was vulnerable. He was already exposed in the soul. And he covers back up. And he jumps off maybe the other side of the boat. Maybe if I hide, he won't see. He'll never know. I'll never have to talk about it. And yet he has, you can't dog paddle forever. So he gets into the shore and Jesus has fish ready for him. And they eat and they do what Jesus does. And Jesus, disguised as his own life, asks him, do you love me? Three times, we know this story. Ask, and each time the intensity increases, do you really love me? What kind of love do you have for us? Seriously, Peter. And we recognize that Peter is being raked. He feels like he's being raked over the coals because in reality, Christ will meet you right where you are. But Christ, the one who confronts us, will first make us confront ourselves. And Peter said, yes. And once the risen Lord sees that Peter is owning his own failures and his own troubles, he says, okay, feed my sheep, tend my flock. We've got work to do, Peter, and there is no time to continue floating on the sea of your own shame and your own guilt. We got to get busy. Now live. And the resurrected Lord standing in front of him disguised as his own life says it's time for you to live. And that's what I'm telling to you, my brothers and sisters today. It's time to live. Every single one of us, if he comes disguised as our own life, my question to you is, what part of the messy life that you are living do you think Jesus is standing in front of asking you to live? Because that's where he consistently comes. Is it, is it possible that you are so disillusioned by the script that you wrote for your life and now it's all ripped up and you're disillusioned by the reality that, well, he left us and I, I feel abandoned and I, I, don't, I don't know what to do next. I don't have any control of the outcome of my life. I'm kind of disillusioned because I wasn't there and I'm not going to take their word for it. I'm, I'm only going to believe if I can see for myself. But let me tell you, if you are disillusioned by something in faith, it is okay to be disillusioned means that you are no longer under the illusion. It means that now you have eyes to see the risen Christ who loves you and wants you to live. It may be possible this very day, he's standing here, disguised as your life, saying, live. Maybe you're here today and, and you're hearing these words and you have longed to live for a long time, but for whatever reason, you have, you have assumed that resurrection is for somebody else, that aliveness and faith is about somebody else. And I'm here to say that you're wrong. It is for you. And the resurrected Lord will nuance the way you understand it, the way you come to believe. He will meet you right where you are so that you can feel the fullness of his aliveness in your life, the only thing it requires is humility, yieldedness, submission. And maybe right where you're sitting today, right now, you pray these words. I am tired, Lord. I am tired of keeping a life propped up that looks alive and looks full of faith and looks like it is a resurrected life when all the while I've been propping it up on my own, never allowing you to heal me, to forgive me, 
and to give me a brand new beginning. So all of that stops right now, and I pray that you would forgive me for the places in my life where I have broken life, and I ask that you would heal me in those places where life has broken me and I had no control over it. And I will follow you, and you will be my God, and I will be your child. I pray that now by faith. In your holy name, amen. And friends, if you prayed that prayer today or you prayed something that sounded or felt like that, I need you to understand that he heard you. The risen Jesus heard you. And your next step in faith is to simply share that with somebody to tell somebody. That's why I'm asking our pastors if they would come and stand at the front of our sanctuary because at the conclusion of our benediction, we will be here to listen to you, to pray with you one-on-one. It may be that you come today because you recognize I just gave my life to something I've never given my life to and I don't know what to do next. And we'll talk to you and pray with you about that. We'll help you. It may be that you've given your life to Christ, but you recognize I've never stepped in the waters of baptism. I've never allowed the world to see that I am immersed in the belovedness of God. And maybe you come today and say, it's time for me to be baptized. It may be that you're coming today because you realize I've got to be a part of a family of faith. And I look around this place and I see people like me people who are imperfect, who have unfinished stories, but who are all attempting to bring their doubt and their faith and and work it out. Join today. Come and join this church family and make JCBC your, your church home. But whatever the decision is that God is prompting in you, don't wait another Easter. Don't wait another Sunday. Don't wait 10 more minutes. Tell somebody today.